Well, I hope to get unstable material into MM stable. So the original idea that MM stable would be the thing for people to develop against, I think, just didn't work out. Everybody ends up either developing against mainline or against MM unstable. That just is what it is. But again, I urge people, once something's in there, let's please try and progress it through as quickly as possible so I can, I can move it into the stable tree as early as possible. Second thing I keep on coming across is when I get version 3 of a patch set. And <coughs> discussion indicates there's going to be a version 4. What do I do? Do I hang on to version 3 and wait for version 4 to come, or do I drop version 3? If I drop version 3, that means the developer can then work against MM Unstable, so that'll make life easy for me. But um, I think there's value in keeping the old version 3 within MM Unstable to getting additional exposure because things keep on turning up, even in the old version, which would be relevant to version 4. Probably I could be a bit more active about that. Ask the developer, you know, do you intend to send a complete new patch set or will you be sending me incremental fixes? So that, um, yeah, often people send me a version 4 because I haven't dropped a version 3 yet. So, interested in any feedback on that notion? And ever, how many times have I asked people to please describe the user space visible effects of your bug fix? <laughs> I always try to make it slightly different. <laughs> Just a little bit. Uh, that's what I do for Korea nowadays. <coughs> also, um, Michelle told me that Greg has got a new CVE process where anything that is targeted for the stable tree gets sent out for triage to an, an appropriate developer to decide whether it's security affecting. Uh, who's involved in that? Greg. Greg. But he sends things out to developers to look at. He's not there. He's a group of three, I guess, people in a CVE team that uh, just do that guessing for all the patches, and they do rely on somebody telling them that this is not a security problem and then explaining them <laughs> that they, they are not assuming any use cases. So it, if it even remotely might be security related, then they rather have stamp it with CVE than be, I don't know what. Okay, that seems a bit strange, seeing as they want to backport everything into everything anyway. Uh, yeah. But I just wonder if there's something we, we or I can do to improve that process by not only describe the user space visible effects, let's have a little think while well, it's fresh in people's minds. Is this security relevant? And if so, add a note into the change or just to grease that process? That would offload. That would change the math because right now we have a uh, very easy producer process for CVE creation and then many different downstreams consumers that have to do that evaluation one by one. So just multiply engineering time by number of downstreams that do really care about security so they responsibly review every single CVE that is landing on their table. If we as MM community, and I would really love to see that in other communities as well, can say that, okay, this fix or this patch is fixing a bug or worn on, <laughs> or something that might trigger the CVE process to create a CVE, and we just make an extra uh, step and think about, okay, so is this security relevant from the memory management community point of view? Right. We can mention that in a change log. And That's what I was thinking we do. We, this is not security relevant because reasons. Beca because reasons, then we save a lot of engineering time downstream to do the same evaluation. And we have that expertise, at least in right. our own subsystem. So right. if we can do that, that, that would spare a lot of engineering time, yes. Okay, so I'll attempt to get that happening. is to say that um, Linus and others often take information about security relevance right back out of change logs, which I think could perhaps defeat that idea 
Um, I don't know if that can be made to work together or not, but I think that would be a stumbling block for, for this idea. S seeing a patch from Linux rise in awareness and make it half CVE. Could you repeat that? So uh, uh, if there is a under-described changelog by Linux or a couple of other usual suspects, then it's have a CVE if you are a reasonable person. You do not need a CVE stamp for that. I, I often put into patches, I can't prove that this isn't a security problem. And I, I, I think that, that may tell you enough. <laughs> yeah, just telling the bad guys where to look. Yeah. And just to clarify, I, I don't mean, most of us are not security experts and sometimes it's really hard to, um, let's say, um, evaluate that something is or is not security relevant. Uh, there have been so many proofs of that a tiny use after free or a race condition might have really detrimental side effects. But I'm talking about low hanging fruit like, uh, okay, so, um, um, hardware poisoning might crash. Who cares? Or uh, memory hot plug can fail. Again, who cares? So uh, those are cases where we can apply our, uh, let's say, common sense and, um, and make it explicit so that we save some time. Of course, there will be many cases where we simply don't know, and rather than say this is not security relevant, then rather not mention anything. And if it takes a C or if it receives a CVE, then okay, then it receives a CVE. It might not be security relevant, but uh, at least just cut off those that ballast that doesn't really help anybody, and it costs a lot of time. So I consume CVEs, um, and um, I would su suggest maybe instead of not security relevant, a more an easier distinction that's just as valuable is um, not triggerable by user space, um, because like for example, uh, Michael called out use after freeze. So if we determine that a use after free can be triggered from user space, that's a local privilege escalation automatically. So we don't go further th to like figure out how to exploit it. Sometimes you might pass it to like a security expert and be like can you sniff this and see how exploitable it looks? And they normally say, yeah, that, just call it a privilege escalation. So what we really want to know is, can you trigger it without like, so yeah, if, if sometimes you see like, this can be triggered by an attacker that can load a kernel module, don't care. Or like this can be triggered. And another thing that would be useful is like, this can be triggered by an attacker with cap admin. Again, kind of don't care. Yeah. I had like exactly the opposite experience of that. Um, I, I had a use after free, but uh, it seemed like it was benign. And so I was working on a fix, and then it turned out that if you went through proc and delayed the process long enough and used another bug that was not fixed because it wasn't very important, then it could be triggered and you could manipulate the pointer in a certain way. So even though it looked benign to me, and I was like, yeah, I'll fix it soon, and I'm working on it, it all of a sudden became this super important CVE, and it, it wasn't triggerable from user space from what I could see, but the person made like this really long file name, and, and, and like it was just insane, but it was like an eight or a nine, like it was. There were a couple of other, not necessarily use after free, but it seems like a simple fix from the MM perspective, but then you get an email from John Horn that says, whoa. <laughs> And another thing that's probably not super relevant, but like um, uh, Shaquille just pointed out, it's great to know not only is it accessible from user space, but is it accessible from a VM guest? And really importantly, is it accessible over the network? Um, yeah. And another thing that's like useful to know is um, does the attacker have to compromise a device to trigger this? And then that different, different users are going to have a different that's going to influence their decision in different ways. So rather than like not security relevant, it's kind of better to say like, here's the conditions that trigger the bug. Yeah. So like sort of as a main maintainer, I, I find the security stuff to be quite kind of, I'm not sure what to do with it. Um, there is a lot of kind of government agencies and contracted, you know, customers of mine that 
there's, there's like legal implications now. Like if I score something and I score it wrong, I'm, is my company in trouble? Am I in trouble? Like, I don't want to touch it because I don't know anything about it, is kind of what I'm saying. I'm, I'm kind of really scared of it. Um, I don't mind if I know that it's network exploitable. I don't mind saying that because I know it's true. But I don't like the other version. I don't like saying I have, I don't know, I, I know that it's not exploitable. Like, I don't ever, I don't want to say that anywhere because I have been through enough of these processes. The security people don't agree with me <laughs> on scoring a lot. Um, so, I, I don't know. I, I know that Greg is trying to affect some change in the industry, but at the present moment, I just don't want to touch it. Sorry. It's just my perspective. Sorry. So I think you said that uh, Capsys admin shouldn't matter. I think it's fair to note that you need a Capsys admin, but it will get a CV anyway because today people care about kernel lockdown, so that's still relevant for them. Yeah. So that, that's the other thing is that you need to distinguish. So I I don't want to say Capsys admin doesn't matter, but I, as a CVE consumer, I want to know whether Capsys admin is required, so then I can apply my own policy about whether Capsys admin matters. Well, that was all I had to bring up. Any general things people like to complain to me about? Because philosophically, I'm here to serve you guys, to smash all your stuff together and attempt to get it upstream without causing too much damage. And um, I don't hear much feedback from you. If there are things that bug you or things you think I should be doing, please let me know. Yeah, there, there, there is one thing that I have noticed several times that, uh, uh, especially with uh, patch set that uh, are getting uh, versions uh, very rapidly, sometimes several times a day. Uh, it would be really great to put some throttling on, on that. So uh, uh, I, I sometimes do that, uh, sometimes do that privately, but uh, it, it's probably good to have that culture that um, it's really good to not send a new version of a pet set if the previous discussion hasn't concluded yet. If there are, um, let's say, follow-up fixes that are a direct result of a discussion, it's always good to just post those incremental changes in, in the thread so that people can see whether we are on the same page. But uh, my experience tells me that um, if, we, if something just lands in your tree, whether that's unstable or stable, then uh, the attention for that particular patch set by the author drops drastically. So as a form of throttling, um, it, it will be better to keep those patches outside until there is at least some consensus that the patch set does what it is aiming to do. OK, noted. Yep, I'll be, <clears throat> I'll be less aggressive. And to a large extent, it depends on who it comes from. <laughs> you know, if it comes from David Hildenbrand or somebody like that, then <laughs> then I, I, te I tend to look at it because this stuff usually works. <laughs> and, but if and it's somebody I've never heard of, yep, I'm going to skip Andrew, it. Andrew, I think there is something like maintainer profile in documentation. John, correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe we should just feel what is uh, there for MM. Mm. Yeah. I didn't understand that. Uh, there is a documentation process uh, subsystem maintainer profiles. Maybe we just need to put one for MM. So I don't want to propose another tree. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, th I think sometimes you pull stuff in just to see like if it, it like it, it looks sane, if it compiles and then it gets like merged into Linux next and then it blows up. So I was wondering if sometimes just to like see like if it compiles and stuff like that to have like an, an even earlier tree and MM unstable would then indicate, well, this is now like really stabilizing. And once it matured there, we're going to move it to MM stable. And that's where we really expect only minor fixes. Again, I'm not going to really suggest that, but sometimes like sometimes Linux next blows up too easily for my taste. Right. So if we had MM stable, MM unstable, MM stupid, but the thing is 
No, nobody would develop on them. I'm oh. stupid, and I wouldn't be able to put it in a Linux mix. So I'm not oh. sure how who would test it. Or, or, or we, we turn MM unstable into a tree that doesn't get pulled into Linux mix. Then there's MM testing that does, and MM stable, which but is a subset of. Good do, yeah. Good yeah. So build build bots. Well, we don't blow up Linux next. The file system people are trying to come up with something that works for them, and Linux next doesn't work for them because we sometimes break their stuff, right? And so that would be a solution for that. Uh, we also have a problem, or at least I noticed this year, the number of emails I got uh, CC'd on for specific files in the MM dropped dramatically. I don't know if there was a change to the get maintainers or something, but a lot of us weren't CC'd on changes that we should have been CC'd on, and so we missed them, and then we end up getting like VMA merge breaking, and we go and say, what just happened, who did it? And I say, Vlasmiel, did you do it? Lorenzo, did you do it? And then we find out it's some new guy that just sent out a patch. I don't know why we're not getting CC'd, so we added ourselves to the maintainer list, and, and you pulled that in uh, for that particular file, but I don't know if this is more of a wider impact uh, than that. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's necessarily the same thing, but if you look at the MM files, a large subset of that does not have, there are implicit maintainers or implicit people that you know to send the patches to or to CC on the patches, but a lot of them are not there. The Git maintainers will not get you those CCs. I don't know if that's by design, like people don't want to get the CCs all the time or, or not, but it's just that a lot of files don't have anyone but Andrew, and I sometimes figure out by looking at the list who to CC, but it's not always obvious. Yeah, but that changed this year. Like, I was getting CC'd, and uh, like, I wrote like 50% of this file, and I'm not getting CC'd, so I don't know what they're looking at, but if you, if you run get maintainers, and like, I'm there, right? I, I would just turn around that question and, and that would be that should we be more explicit about maintainers uh, in the MM area so that maintainers file uh, contains specific people responsible for specific areas and make the life of get maintainers or whoever use that file easier? Because I, I think so, yeah. I mean, I think we should. And, and that's what we did for this one particular file, but I mean, I, at this point, I think I'm going to be listed on all of the files and all of the architectures, like just because of what I've done, right? What have you done? <laughs> maybe, Andrew, maybe it's for you, just if it comes from some random people without seeing people, you know, just to you and the Linux MM, just hold off a bit with the patch with applying yeah. it to Linux you know, MM unstable. I spend a lot of, I spend a lot of time making sure the right people have seen the right email. Um, but I think the actual Linux MM itself, the volume is tractable for people to check fairly regularly. No. I, I, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, let, let's say that uh, if, if we have a under CC uh, patch set or a, a patch that uh, get maintainers doesn't really return anybody and we know that there is a clear, let's say expert in that area, maybe that's a proper trigger to update that maintainers file. So page fold driven. <laughs> So some of you may be aware of this, but, but Constantine is the sysadmin and he created Lore. Uh, Lore, I don't know, Lore. Um, one of the tools in his toolbox is called Lay, L-E-I. And one of the neat things you can do with Lay is you can subscribe to a file. And if you subscribe to a file, it will automatically collect all of the patches that are posted to mailing lists that touch that file automatically. And you can do that without the maintainer's file or get maintainers or really anyone doing anything other than send diffs out. So like I've done that for some of the stuff I maintain and I find that it's really effective. You can also subscribe to functions. So if you like this function in this file, you can subscribe to that. So you know, some of you that have like more narrow interests, that might be a really good approach. It doesn't need get maintainers, it doesn't need maintainers file manipulation or any of that sort of ceremony, let's say. Uh, and it does work quite well, yeah. Crunch, do a lot of crunching with git blame and figure out who owns what and then sort of centralize that. 
so, so regarding the comment that Linux MM is tractable, uh, it might be, but uh, you might have reserved some time, or sometimes you're busy, and sometimes you are not busy and can check it. But CCing is always like interrupt. Like you, you are notified immediately that something's going on. And yeah, lay my me the solution for that. And for the get maintainers thing, I don't know if anything changed, but it always always guaranteed you would get uh, the people from the maintainers entry, and then it might look at the git history and suggest additional people that change it to uh, to CC. But it's not guaranteed, so we should really do the maintainers thing. Okay, well, point taken. I mean, Linux and MM in my inbox are basically duplicates of each other. So I'll make, I'll make sure that uh, I'll, I'll pay more attention to the issue. The other thing that I maybe could suggest to Andrew is something I do is the, um, like if a patch has a fixes line, um, and NetDev does this as well, you want to see that the the people who authored the patch being fixed are CC'd, right? That's really important. That, that, that covers a lot, a pretty wide, you know, pretty wide swath of the right people. Yeah, I spent a lot of, of time in Git Blame. Yeah, yeah well, Git Blame. Uh, so I've got three things I wanted to mention. Um, I think the second one's the easy one. The, the Rust people are, gagging to get their MM patches in. I've had a look over them. They don't look awful from my point of view, but I don't know Rust. I looked at it, it was all Rust. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's things like wrappers around struct page, it's wrappers around various MM things, and they're like, hey, hey, Willie, are you going to merge these for our next merge? And I'm like, I feel that would be overstepping, because I'm just a page cache maintainer uh, try to, talking to Andrew. Uh, and they said, oh, OK, I'll do that. And I said, well, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up at LSFMM. Um, <laughs> oh, OK, so, so you, you think it should go in through the Rust tree? OK, cool. I'll, I'll, I'll let them know. Um, uh, the third one probably is also fairly straightforward. There's, there's some patches out on this to split up the headers, and mm -hmm. the guy who, yeah, you, you, you reviewed them as well, David. Um, the, the guy who's doing them doesn't really seem to understand, well, MM. He, he's, he's just, he's trying to solve his problem, which is, you know, compilation takes too long, compile time. Um, I'm really concerned about those patches because I think it's going to make our lives a lot harder. I appreciate it's going to make his life much better but I, mm, I, I, I really want to say no to those patches. Do you have any thoughts on those? I did look at some, and they were, and they were quite visibly broken. I haven't paid much attention since. Um, and I thought, well, well wasn't Ingo going to redo the entire world? What happened to that project? I mean, I, I last I heard from that was two years ago. I, I assume yeah. it's, it's been dropped in favor of more important projects. Okay. Mm. So no, I, people mess around with headers. It, it's... Oh, the uh, memory profiling messed with vmalloc deletion. God, that kept us going for a while. Oh, God, I bet it did. Yeah, yeah, I saw some of those. Mm. Um, and and the, the third one is, this wasn't even my idea. There's, there's a bunch of people who've come up to me. And I, again, I don't know why people come to me. Um, <laughs> saying, hey, has MM been t talking about doing a group maintainership? I was like, no. Uh, should we? Does I, I don't know that it would fix any problems that we currently have. Do, do, do you have any problems that a, a kind of group maintainership might help fix? I don't think so. I mean, it it's kind of is a group maintainership, only I kick the patches around. Yeah. You know, there are things that I would you know, never send upstream without the appropriate people having spent the appropriate amount of time with it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy with the process, so I, this isn't coming from me. This is just, I think, people outside saying, hey, is Andrew, do we have a bus factor of one? <laughs> like, is, is, is Andrew our weakest link? It's like, well, you know. I'm <laughs> Andrew looks pretty scalable to me right now. I mean, you know. I <laughs> Quite a bit of stuff other than MM. I do, I do a lot less non-MM stuff than I used to. My world record was 1,100 patches in one cycle. Now I'm down to about 400, 500. So. And you know, for, 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 for me personally, I just want to say thank you. Um, you, you, you. As far as I'm concerned, you're doing a great job. So, and I, I'm seeing a lot of nodding. So you know, round of applause, perhaps. <laughs>